Welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 185, with a returning guest, Mr. Augustine Cordes. Now, you may recall I interviewed Augustine about uh, two years ago, I guess he was. Uh, I interviewed him about this game, Scratches, one of my favorite uh, point and click adventure games. Very scary game, a lot of fun. He's uh, been working on a new one for quite a while now called Asylum. He was even talking about it back then. Uh, well, it's been in development all this time, it's almost done, uh, but he's uh, taken a Kickstarter to try to raise the last $100,666 he needs uh, to actually get this game finished. Anyway, uh, he's back to tell us all about it. Uh, so without further ado, here is, once again, Mr. Augustine Cordes. All right, folks, I am here with the great Augustine Cordes. You may know him from a, one of the scariest adventure games I know I've ever played, one called Scratches. I, I still have nightmares about that game. Uh, really scary stuff. But anyway, you might be excited to know he's back with a, a new game. It looks even scarier uh, than Scratches, if you can believe that, Asylum. How are you doing today, uh, Augustine? Fine. Thank you very much. I'm glad to speak with you again, Matt. Uh, we're having a very exciting time, you know, at Silum. It's, uh, yes, it's looking good. It's gaining popularity lately. And definitely it's going to be much scarier than Scratches. You can bet. Well, let's just talk first before we get into the, you know, the Kickstarter part of this. What, what is Asylum? And how, how, is that, how is this project going to be different than Scratches? Um, I learned a lot of, you know, mistakes I made with Scratches. Uh, over time, I realized that the design, you know, had a very rough edges, lack of good, good pacing at times, uh, some unintentional pixel hunting. So um, in a way, Asylum is like the, you know, the vengeance of that project. It's like everything I learned from scratches, I want to, you know, just to make it better this time. But I always wanted to do a game based on a mental institute. I think the, the, these are the scariest places on earth. And I love the environment too. Um, Many are asking us about the story. We don't want to give many details about that, but uh, you take the role of an ex-patient returning to this institute. And the minute you set foot inside this huge building, um, everything just goes, becomes very surreal and weird and filled with many unexpected twists. You know, many, uh, in a way, uh, Scratches was a very cliché plot. To if, if I told you on paper what the game is about, yeah, the horror writer returning, uh, moving to an old mansion, uh, it sounded very cliché. But people that play the game know that the story became quite complex and quite atypical. You know, it, it was quite an atypical haunted house, and that is basically what we are trying to do with the Asylum: a different take on the typical. Uh, gritty mental institutes. Now, one thing you're going to notice right away about Asylum, how huh, folks, if you played Scratches, is the interface is different. You know, Scratches has that sort of mist-like, uh, point-and-click style. This seems more like a for almost a first-person shooter, like uh, engine to it, right? Well, you know, <clears throat> yes. Actually, we didn't change much in the basic interface. What we did is just make it feel much better, more fluid, more dynamic. Uh, we definitely took uh, cues from first-person uh, shooters uh, because, in a way, people are growing uh, accustomed to that, you know, the, the quick gameplay. Um, this doesn't mean that Asylum will be action-oriented or we play exactly like a first-person shooter, but we took many of those things and incorporated them in, in Asylum, sorry. For example, uh, the, the slow breathing effect, uh, when you walk, there is this smooth movement that you know makes you feel as if you are really controlling your character. Um, and another aspect is that, yes, we really simplifying the interface, making it uh, immediately accessible uh, there's not a, you don't have a typical inventory either. You just carry a notepad. And that notepad that you can open at any time you want and just 
keep it open as you keep playing. Uh, that is a sort of journal slash inventory slash dialogue system. If I explain how it works, it's going to sound weird, but uh, it works so far. People that played our interactive teaser uh, felt, you know, felt it was a comfortable, comfortable interface. So you're not going to have any objects that the player can pick up, like keys or chainsaws, or uh... it would be great to pick a chainsaw. Huh? <laughs> um, no, yeah, you definitely pick can pick objects, and you have to use them as well. But they are always uh, represented on this journal. It's like it's a like a concept. I mean. The protagonist makes a note about the, ob the object he's carrying and uh, when you click on that note, he always will make a comment related to this item or the purpose, the purpose of this item. And you can ask other characters about this item. So it's a very streamlined interface that tries to make, you know, put in that journal just about all you need to know about the current status of the game. That's the basic idea of it. But yes, there's going to be sort of inventory-based puzzles, yes. One thing that's uh, a little bit confusing to me is I'm watching the, this Kickstarter video, right? And there's a lot of humor. I mean, I laughed uh, several times so, during the video. And I'm just wondering, is, uh, is some of the comedy going to be in the game or is the game going to be traditional, uh, serious sort of horror no, 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 no. This uh, the game is is pure pure horror. I mean, and I mean, even scratches had a bit of comedic relief at times. Okay, there there might be one or two witty comments from the protagonist. Those one in, in the teaser actually. Uh, we're going to include a few, you know, Easter eggs, funny references, but the game is mostly pure horror and it gets quite gruesome at times. Uh, the, the crazy humor, it's just our style. I know it's a very, there's a big contrast between what we are showing and what we are saying or doing, but no, no, it's very serious, the game. Yeah. I mean, you're not worried at all that people might look at the Kickstarter page and get the wrong impression, of, especially if they haven't played Scratches, you know, they might get the wrong impression and think this is <laughs> going to be a Monkey Island style a comedy experience instead of this, a really dark H.P. Lovecraft sort of thing. Um, it's a good question. Honestly, I couldn't say, but, uh, you know, it's very common to see uh, funny videos on Kickstarter. So I think they will get the idea that it's, it's not really what the game is going to be like. And in any case, we are showing quite a few creepy sequences on the Kickstarter video. Uh, so I think that shouldn't be a big problem. It's like a chainsaw I'm hearing in the background there. Is there... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry the torch guy on the torture rack. Yeah, it's the slaughterhouse that we, <laughs> we have right here. And they're just butchering the bodies. Sorry, sorry. It's they preparing, preparing dinner. Well, as long as the sound of the screaming doesn't bleed into the video, I guess we, <laughs> we're fine. Uh, okay. now, so just kind of continuing with this uh, contrast, I noticed you have a, a guy actually, I've actually interviewed on the show before, Josh Mandel. A really funny mm -hmm. guy. You know, of course, he's done some serious uh, narrative work too. But I'm just wondering, why did of all people would you pick him uh, to play these? He's the narrator, right, or the main character? Uh, it's a uh, it's an interesting anecdote. I first got in touch with him uh, quite a few years ago. I think about the time we made the first video, like two years ago. And at first, he was going to do a small cameo, you know, uh, one of the characters that we have, one of the inmates. Uh, I thought he would do, a, you know, silly character that would, would fit well in this role. But um, when he made the, the test for us and I listened to, to his recording, I thought, wow, I can't believe it. This is 
the exact voice I had in mind for the protagonist. And it, it occurred then that we didn't have the main role yet. So I kind of asked him, hey, Josh, uh, would, would you be comfortable doing the main role? There are, you know, there are many, many lines. And he said, yeah, let's do this. I, I, he wanted to do a serious role. You know, he, until now, he's only done uh, uh, funny roles or fantasy roles like King Raham, uh, other, other voices, but this would be his first really serious role. And he's doing just great. I think he's, he's going to be an amazing character, definitely. Okay, so I noticed that you're asking for 100000 uh, $666, which is not nearly as much as just a lot of these other game projects. I'm just wondering, uh, what do you what do you need this money for? Well, it, it may sound like a lot of money for a small indie team like ourselves, but right now we're just two people working on the game. Uh, we were more before. Uh, truth is, we have run out of money. Keep in mind that I have been funding this project with money from my own pocket. There are no investors, no publishers. We are literally alone. And I made a budget <clears throat> uh, to bring five people and all of us working in an office for uh, 10 to 12 months, you know, uh, because, of course, I can't uh, ask for the exact money that we need to put the, to finish the game because they are going. We, we we have to do more tasks, you know, more 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 things after after the game is complete. Otherwise, I can't just tell everybody, okay, guys, go. It, it's done. The idea is to keep working on on asylum, extend the game, do more 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 ports. So um, the money, yes, it's. It's what we need to finish the game, and of course, uh, taking into consideration, you know, every potential problem or delay that we can can find uh, during the, these final stages of the project. Um, it's not much. If you begin, you know, uh, doing the math, five folks working in an office, paying taxes, plus all the deductions. That um, Kickstarter takes for the, for themselves, Amazon as well, and I'm not lying when when I say this that I haven't included any wages for myself on this budget. I mean, I'm still not making any money at all from a side. In fact, the extra 666 those are my wages for this Kickstarter. So uh, it, it's not a lot of money to do what we need to do now. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the $666 for it. I was looking at some comments about the, the Kickstarter elsewhere. You know, some people were, I guess, uh, wondering what was up with that. You know, it seems like kind of a a funny number. I mean, it was kind of a joke to put in six, uh, 666. Yeah, it's a funny joke. I know. I, I think some were amused, others not so much. I think um, they thought it was a bad taste joke um, but yeah maybe I should be more more clear when I explain the budget uh, stress that I didn't include any wages for myself which is you know pretty much insane because I need to make a living as well um, so I don't know I thought it was a funny joke you know something uh, distinct to have on the budget uh, so far many at least our backers, you know, uh, everybody that has been following the project and supporting us, they just thought it was really amusing. So I, I'm not really worried about that. I think it's I think it's funny myself. I was kind of surprised that people had that negative yeah. response, but you know, oh well. Yeah, there's there's a bit of everything, you know. Some people are saying, "Are you insane? Asking for all this money?" and Really, we are showing you a lot of the game. The game exists. Uh, we have lots of artwork, uh, stuff to tell you. You can even play it, the short demo. Um, but, you know, yeah, there's always uh, negative people that, you know, any, any, anything that just uh, seems 
slightly out of place and they bash you because of that. But from my perspective, generally, I would say that the project, uh, um, we have some very supportive backers. Uh, they are very, very glad that we are doing this. So I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with what we are doing here. One, one thing I, I definitely wanted to mention is I think uh, some of the other comments I looked at, there's some confusion about the game and the Kickstarter because it's uh, been greenlit by Steam. I saw somebody was saying, well, it's been greenlit by Steam, so why are they asking for more, for more money? I don't think they understand yeah. the whole thing. So you, could you just kind of explain all that? Yes. That's a, that's quite a problem. Quite a problem because I, I have read some negative comments about that. Truth is that becoming greenlit, uh, it's just like getting a pass, you know, Getting a pass to be published on Steam the minute the game is ready. And that's it. It doesn't mean that money begins to rain from the sky. Uh, it, it didn't change any of our finances to become greenlit. What it did, however, which was very important for this Kickstarter, and I, I have to admit that one of the reasons that we're doing the Kickstarter is because we were successful on Steam um, it's like a, a guarantee, you know. It means that the community approved the game, the community liked the game, and even to, to other gamers, and especially to the press, to the mainstream press, it's like a big endorsement, you know. Okay, fine, people people are really looking forward to this game. We, we should begin to cover this. Uh, remember, Doing this without a publisher, it means that it, it's a, a huge, huge amount of work to become noticed, uh, especially because we're doing an, an adventure game. Uh, there are still many websites biased against, against uh, adventures, and unless you are, you know, a big name in the industry or you have a, you know, a strong pedigree, they will ignore you. That's, that's the harsh truth. So, yeah, back to the green light thing. It doesn't mean anything in terms of money. And I decided to remain, all of us, to remain solo and deal with the community instead of going uh, to, to a publisher. So uh, let's see what happens now. This kind of brings up a point with Steam and uh, DRM. You know, one of the things that I've said in some of my blog posts is I'd never want to support a Kickstarter if at the end of it the, the product was going to have DRM on it. And it seems, I was looking at some of your updates, and it seems like you're not, you not only agree with that, but you want to go several steps further and actually share some of the assets and, and uh, even the engine so other people could use the, these resources that you're developing now. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I really like to community-oriented things. I, I love when we, the whole team, interact with the community, you know, get feedback, make them feel like we are part of the development. So um, open sourcing the engine, Dagon, was a very, very early decision. I knew that eventually I would want to, to do this. And um, about, about the assets, this is a very fresh idea that we have, uh, especially, it came from a backer even, and I thought, hey, it's a really nice idea. Um, we have created this huge environment that you can explore in, in any way you want, and we have a very strong, coherent story that is the main point of the game. But I thought, okay, but we still have this environment. Uh, it could be reused for other things. Uh, players could just create their custom stories, like um, like gamers create mods for Skyrim or the levels uh, in Doom. I don't know. Uh, and I thought, yeah, this this isn't common in uh, adventures, but why not? I mean, we have the environment. Uh, we won't do anything else with the game. 
when it's done, when, when, when it's ready, when it's uh, selling. So I thought, yeah, it's, uh, it could be big, you know, to have the community, uh, a stronger community working with that, creating more stories. Of course, I, I think it, it could mean more sales because it means, you know, plenty of activity with asylum. Um, but honestly, I, in this particular aspect, I'm not thinking about sales it's just like yeah once the game is done we are going to move on we have no plans to do any sequels for it um but that's not quite true we do want to do um, an expansion of sorts uh which is also mentioned on that uh, mysterious update on the kickstarter we want to do a a, a, a version of the asylum in bright daylight because the game takes place within one night and if we get enough funds, we are uh, we would like to uh, redo the whole thing with during the day. It's it's crazy. It's crazy. I know it sounds crazy. We basically want to redo the whole graphics, and then we want to you know just take the advantage of this uh, huge and detailed game world that we have created. I think that's a really brilliant way, uh, that a direction that you're going uh, with this idea. Even if you don't necessarily want to play Asylum, which I can't imagine, but let's just say you don't. I mean, there's still a good reason to support it because you are uh, giving back to, to the community. So other other adventure games could be made using these resources. Yes, yes. Um... Like I said, we we chose we would like to move on as soon as we are done with all these uh, plans that we have for for asylum. Our plan is to move on, but um, it's always important for me to have a strong community supporting us and giving them these uh, small gifts, if you wish. Uh, it's a, it, exactly what keeps the flame going, to put it somehow. And honestly, I would be happy myself to see, to play some of these stories, because I think it would be really interesting, you know. So one of the ideas, if we secure enough funds, is to give the players uh, both versions of the Asylum, nighttime and, and daylight. So you can just go crazy and create uh, any story that you want based on the Hanwell Institute. And, and that means you can you will be able to add your own assets and graphics. Why not? So it, it should be fun. And we got the, the DRM. Sorry. Um, yes, we want we don't want any kind of DRM on Asylum. I've had bad experiences myself uh, with Star Force, a Cripple copy protection system that uh, you know. Many, many players couldn't run the game. Many legitimate buyers couldn't uh, play scratches because it was crippled. Um, I really don't want anything to do with any type of DRM. I'm thinking about that as a gamer, not as a developer. I just want to make sure that legitimate buyers, our community, our audience, can play the game without any worries whatsoever. So what do you say to somebody who says, you know, this this looks okay, but I don't, you know, I got sixty dollars, but I'd rather wait until the game comes out, you know, than buy it after I've, you know, seen some uh, reviews and such. Is, I mean, what would you say, or what does that person need to hear, I guess, before they say, oh, I get it now, I'll go ahead and invest in the in the Kickstarter. Um. Well, yes, I would tell them that we didn't really need to reach this goal. Because uh, if we don't, it means putting the game on hold for a while and do something else in the meantime. Because we need to start making money. It's the harsh truth. I mean, we, we can't support this team, this project, without money. So uh, I would tell them, okay, if you want to play Asylum as soon as possible, like this year, then please support us. Because if not, it would mean at least two years or more until you play the game, you know. So that give us time to do something shorter, a shorter adventure that we can sell, even if it's for I don't know, ten dollars, but to make money somehow. 
Asylum is a really big project. It's scaled way out of proportions. And we are confident that it's going to be a very engrossing title, an experience that if few plates scratches, uh, it's like three times scratches, three, three times the more complex story, more details, three times larger environment. So there's a lot to do. And, um, and, and a lot, you know, like we have been talking a, a lot of lifetime after you play the game because there's so much stuff to do in the Hanwell game world. But to do all these, these ambitious plans, we need the money. <laughs> what will happen if you don't make the goal? I mean, how devastating is that going to be for you? What, sorry? If, I mean, how big of a letdown would it be if you don't make the goal? Uh, the game will still come out, right? But I'm just kind of wondering, how uh, much is writing on this? It's a lot. <laughs> to be honest, this, this Kickstarter campaign, it's way stressing. Just uh, get this thing going. It, it was an insane amount of work, especially for us, that we had to do it we will help in the United States because, uh, you know, as you know, Kickstarter uh, does not support other countries other than uh, the UK and USA. So it was months and months of preparation. Uh, the Kickstarter page alone, uh, it's a lot of work, the video. So it will be, I have to admit, quite a bit discouraging if you don't make the goal because it means to like I said, probably putting things on hold for a while, relax, think about the plan B, uh, maybe try once again with Kickstarter, but you know what it means. If you do the same project, it means that you have to ask for a lesser budget, there's going to be less excitement about the Kickstarter, and it means compromising, and we don't want to compromise this game. We have been working on this for four years, and we just want to make it the best game we can without compromises. Uh, that's why we have prepared all this. Yeah. Is there anything else that you want to add to this? Any additional reasons to support the Kickstarter that we haven't thought about? I was kind of thinking about this. Uh, why not support, the, I mean, supporting this project is also supporting a whole region, uh, you know, a region of uh, game the games industry that really hasn't gotten a lot of support. You're just mentioning that you can't. You had to go through all kinds of hoops just to get the Kickstarter uh, to up there. Yeah, I mean that's just. I'd love to have more yeah. than just the U.S. and Japan and uh, the U.K. involved in the games industry. Yeah, it's true. And I remember remember that last time when we did the chat two years ago or three. I don't know anymore. Uh, I remember remember that you asked about the status in Argentina. And it was doing well here. It was doing really well. But um, right now, things have kind of cooled down. Uh, we don't have that many projects here uh, in, in the country, you know, that could be interesting to, to foreigners. So, yeah, things have kind of stalled down. And in a way, the success of this project could mean perhaps a small boost to the industry here. And I think it will also be uh, the right message to uh, independent uh, developers, especially when it comes to the adventure genre. So far, we are having a huge success of adventures on Kickstarter, which is awesome. I have backed all of those projects. I'm very, very happy that uh, the adventure genre is getting this um, renewed interest everywhere. But, uh, like I said, it was still developers with quite a lot of pedigree. And there are many smaller projects I know of more adventures, more indie adventures that are going to resort to, to Kickstarter. So, supporting the indies on this uh, crowdfunding platform is very important. So I think if we are successful, it will make others more more confident to do the same. It will encourage backers maybe to take a look at others too. 
and we have the engine. Remember, anything, uh, everything we do for the Dagon engine, Dagon engine, sorry, uh, everything we do for this, uh, it's all, always going to go back to the community. So uh, I think quite a bit of reasons, you know. All right, so about that shelf back there, uh, Augustine. <laughs> what do you guys suspended? Loom. Uh, what's yeah. your favorite out of uh, out of this? My favorite item of yeah. this. Uh, yeah, definitely the suspended mask. I mean, if your house was burning down right now and you could only grab three of those games, what would you take with you? Suspended the oh, I have the Starcross saucer too somewhere. Uh, and the Game Raid Night funky shaped box. You know, this one, it's a bit, I have to repair it a bit. This one, I got it for maybe five bucks. The guy didn't know what he was selling. And this one, many collectors go crazy when I say this, but, but this one was sealed. And I had to open it because I can't stand keeping sealed games. I had to open them because otherwise I don't feel like they're mine. So, sorry, collectors everywhere because of that. So, no, I, when I pledged to the Asylum Project, I made sure to get into the, into the tier where I get the, the box. Uh, so what kind of box mm. are you thinking of? Something cool, I hope? Oh, yes. I will do exactly one of these because I think this is like the, the best uh, shape for a box ever. It's compact, but very attractive, and this, I love this. So our record book of the Insane of the Kickstarter is going to be printed like this, with all sorts of uh, interesting details about the Hungry Institute. And it's going to be twice as large as this, more, more or less. And this is the format I most like of, of every, of any box I own. And we're going to include Phillies as well. In an upcoming update, I'm going to reveal uh, one or two of them that we have in mind already. Excellent. So it sounds like if you really want to get the full experience of the game, you'll definitely want to get the box copy. And it's cheap. Uh, compared to other Kickstarters, the entry level to get the box, it's quite, quite cheap. How, mu how yes. much is it? Do you know off the top of your head? $75. And includes shipping anywhere in the world. So definitely not bad. I think the other box copies yeah. I've gotten were upwards of well over a hundred dollars anyway. So yes, yes. In fact, we are not making that much money out of that tire. Uh, we decided to, you know, maybe tempt uh, backers with more gifts. You know, if you go for the one hundred. Pledge tire, you get access, instant access to, to betas of the game, and they're going they're going to come quite quickly, you know, as pretty much uh, within one or two months once we are done with the with the campaign. So uh, we wanted to make sure that yeah, as many as possible want to get the box. Uh, it's not a it's not a huge revenue for us, but we are counting that uh, many will want to jump on hybrid. Pledges. And you know, there's the chance you can become uh, a resident of the Hanwell Institute. It's going to be real, real fun because uh, we, it, some tires will just put your name here and there. It's going to be very visible. But the higher you go, the more exposure you get. And, and it goes crazier as you go. You can be an actual inmate with a profile, with a custom story that you are going to, to create with us. We are going to get a picture from you and make you look like an actual inmate. And you can even become dead, a dead inmate in, in the morgue. I mean, it's, it's fun, really. That sounds awesome to me. I do have uh, one requirement. You know, one thing that I, I have to have in a game before I will consider purchasing it. And... I'm pretty sure Asylum has it, but just just to make sure, I mean, this this game will have rats in it, right? It 
has a dead cat. No rats. You want rats? It's got to have rats in it. Okay, I, I make a note of that. Okay, rats. Fine. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Fine. Okay. Fine. I mean, man, it, it's it's you. It, if it, it, this this request is very special, we were definitely doing doing rats then. Sure. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Hardly hairy rats. Definitely. It's in the asylum. Okay. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week, hopefully, uh, with a new piece from Tom Hall. He's uh, agreed to come on the show and tell us about his Kickstarter. Of course, I'll be delving into his past as well, so stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you if you have supported the show. Guys, if you like these shows, please throw a few dollars into the Bard's hat. You can do that at the Matt Chat link at armchairarcade.com. Just go there, look in the top right, and you can set up a subscription. Dollar a month, dollar a week, or a one-time uh, fee. Uh, whatever you want to do, it's fine, and I really, really appreciate it, guys. Now, what about that ale of the week? Ah, uh, there it is. Uh, this week I've got a little number called the Shiner Hefeweizen. This is uh, came out of a, a variety pack of Shiners. They were all quite good, but I saved this one uh, for the show. Uh, this is a one. This is brewed in Shiner, Texas, apparently at the Spotzel Brewery. Hope I'm pronouncing that. Uh, quite an old brewery. I've uh, heard that some of these uh, some of these breweries have actually been bought out by some of the big big corporations. I don't see any. If that's true about this, they're keeping it well hidden, I guess. But anyway, let's see, handcrafted. It's actually really hard to read this font. It's sort of light yellow on orange. Uh, a hint of clover, honey, and orange and lemon peels. Well, oh. sounds good, I guess. I don't see anything else here. <laughs> anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I have some of this shiny... Sorry, Shiner Heffy Weizen here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling it. it smells a. Uh, there's a slight skunkiness to it, but uh, the lemon, clover, and orange are there too. Uh, actually, quite nice. Not not a bad. Just a little bit skunked, I think. Uh, but anyway, let's give it a taste. Hopefully, it won't be too bad. Ah. Uh. Actually, quite good. A uh, very strong lemon flavor here. A uh, very citrusy, zesty. If you really want a, a lemon uh, zest kind of thing going on with your ale, this would be a very good choice. Uh, otherwise, you probably wouldn't like this. Actually, quite refreshing. I, I rather like this one. It's uh, not the best type of bites I've ever had by any means, but it's it's refreshing and it's crisp and probably be really great on a on a really hot day, really hot summer afternoon be a great uh, ale to cool down with. Anyway, I'm going to go uh, two out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, it's not bad, but there's just too many, there's <laughs> so many better Hefeweizens out there. Uh, two out of five. Okay, what about that quotation? Uh, of course, I found one from H.P. Lovecraft for this episode, and it goes something like this. Toil without song is like a weary journey with no end. See you guys next week. Hey, listen to this. From Monday to Friday, the New York Public Library presents the Necronomicon. I didn't know the library did rock concerts. It's not a rock group, Winston. It's the single most powerful book of magic spells ever written. H.P. Lovecraft and others wrote a whole series of horror stories based on it. Come on. We gotta see it. I'll bet the copyright page alone has a PKE valence of 9.9. .9.